Modal logic is really fun for logicians because we get to draw these diagrams and put all these arrows going between possible worlds and play around with them to make them do different things. How do we actually go about putting a model together? Is there any rule behind it? Let me show you. Welcome back to Attic Philosophy. Welcome to a very dark attic. We are doing a series of videos introducing the basics of modal logic. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to build models in all of the different systems of modal logic that we've been looking at. And we're also going to look at how to use that technique to build counter models, counter examples to entailments that don't work. So if you're enjoying these videos, if you're finding them useful, why don't you tell me that in the comments down below? Now, it's kind of a radical concept to be saying nice things to people on the internet, but give it a go. Oh yeah, you could also subscribe to the channel. That'd be good too. We're going to need some basic concepts first. First, we're going to need to understand what we mean by a sentence being satisfiable. So basically, satisfiability just means that the sentence is true. In the context of modal logic, that means that there is a state in a model that makes that sentence true. Okay, so a sentence is satisfiable when some state in some model makes it true. And even more specifically, because we have all these different systems of modal logic, we might, for instance, be interested in whether a sentence is ref satisfiable. That means satisfiable at some state in a reflexive model, a model where the accessibility relation is a reflexive relation. Or we might be looking at whether a sentence is transitive satisfiable, okay, satisfiable in some transitive model or whatever. Okay, so if you're not sure about what I mean by reflexive models, transitive models or whatever, go back to the previous video where we look at different systems of modal logic. Here's a quick reminder. So we have these different systems of modal logic corresponding to the frame condition. That is the condition that we put on the accessibility relation, whether there's nothing in particular, whether it's serial, reflexive, symmetrical, transitive, Euclidean. And we've also got different combinations of these things. OK, a reminder of what these conditions look like. Reflexive is all about each world having a loop on it. Symmetrical means that any arrow is a two way arrow. Transitive means that whenever you've got arrows, you've also got shortcuts. Serial means that every world has an arrow going out of it. And Euclidean, this is the tricky one. It means whenever you've got these worlds, that can both be seen by some world, there's an arrow between those worlds. OK, like I say, that's the tricky one. OK, so suppose in general we have this sentence A and we want to show that it is, for instance, ref satisfiable, satisfiable in a reflexive model. What's our general strategy going to be? What we need is a state that makes that sentence true. So what we do is we start off by building that state. We say, here's a state, and we're just going to assume that that state makes a true. And then we're going to start at that state and build outwards. We're going to build up our model from there. And we'd also better check that it's a reflexive model. So as we go, as we add new states, we better make sure that they've all got loops on them. OK, so I've written this out in steps one, two and three, but steps two and three, they kind of interrelate. So as we build our model and we maybe add new states, we have to make sure they've all got loops on them. So it's going to be a reflexive model. OK, and if it was a transitive model or a symmetrical model, we would do that slightly differently. We would have to make sure that every time we add an arrow, it's a two way arrow if we're after a symmetrical model. Or we'd have to make sure that whenever we've got two arrows in our model, then we've always got a shortcut if we're looking for a transitive model. OK, so that's the general strategy. Let's see how that works in particular with an example. OK, so we're going to try to show that this sentence Diamond P or Q and box not P is ref satisfiable, satisfiable, true at some state in a reflexive model. So before I show you the official technique for doing this, I want you to have a go. Just have a guess, OK? Try and find a model that's got a state in it that makes this sentence true. Hit pause on the video, have a go at that. And then when we come back, I will show you the official way of doing it. And let's see if our answers agree. 
So here's how I worked through this question. I started off by writing down the sentence we're interested in and putting a T there to say it's true. So we're assuming that sentence is true. I've drawn a box around it. That's representing a possible world. It's a possible world where this sentence is true. I called it world S and I put a loop on it because we're after a reflexive model. This sentence is a conjunction. It's true. So that must mean both conjuncts are true. So I've written down both conjuncts and a T to say they're true. This one says diamond something. Diamond means there is an accessible world where that thing's true. So I added a new world where P or Q is true. I added an arrow between them to say that this one is accessible from here. I called this world U and I put a loop on it again because we're looking for a reflexive model. This sentence here is a box sentence. That means every accessible world. So I want not P in every accessible world. Both worlds are accessible. So I'm going to put not P true in both worlds. And when not P is true, P is false. OK, so look over in this world here. We've got P or Q being true, but P is false. So it must follow that Q is true. There I'm done with that world. I've got a valuation that tells me Q is true, but P is false. Over in this world, I've got P being false, but I haven't got any valuation for Q. I don't know whether Q is true or false in that world. I've actually got no information here that tells me. So in fact, I can make it up. I can choose between Q being true and Q being false. So it doesn't matter. I'll just make it false. So that's me done. I've constructed my model because in each state I have a valuation. And if we go back through it and work it out, we can see that that valuation is going to make that sentence true. So that's a perfectly good model. If we want to draw it out in the way that we're more familiar with, it would look like this. We've got two states, S and U. We've got an arrow going between them. We've got loops on each state. What's true where? Well, in this state, both P and Q are false, so we don't draw them in there. And in this state, P is false and Q is true. So I've drawn a Q in there. Now, I think it's sometimes a good idea just to kind of think through what is the sentence that we're interested in actually saying? And then can we use that to check that the model that we've drawn actually does work? So what is this sentence saying? Well, it's saying that P or Q is possible, but P is necessarily false. OK, so P is false everywhere, but P or Q has to be possible. So there has to be somewhere with Q true. Is our model saying that? Yeah. P is false everywhere, but there's somewhere where Q is true. So this model will make that sentence true. There are going to be other models that satisfy that sentence. Some of them are going to be simpler. In fact, a single possible world where just Q is true with a loop on it, that will make that sentence true. So the method that we've used here, it won't always give us the simplest model, but it will give us a correct model if there is one. So as I was going through and constructing that model, I had some rules in mind. Here they are. If you've got A and B being true, then you add both A true on its own and B true on its own, just like you'd expect from the truth table. And if you've got A and B false, then you get to choose either make A false or make B false. If you've got A or B true, again, you choose. If you've got A or B false, you make them both false. True implication, you can choose either the antecedent true or the consequent false. False implication, make the antecedent true and the consequent false. True by conditional, either you make them both true or you make them both false. You get to choose. False by conditional, you want to make one true, the other false. You get to choose which way round it is. So where I say choose there, I'm not giving you much information about which one you choose because we don't always know in advance. OK, so you're going to have to make a choice. And if the model goes wrong, like you can't build the model because you've got a contradiction, maybe you have to wind back and make the other choice. Sometimes you have to try out lots of different choices to see if your model comes out right. If you can build that model because the sentence is satisfiable, then some choice will work out and you might have to play around with which choice it is. If, on the other hand, none of the choices work out, then that shows you that the sentence isn't satisfiable. So those are the rules for the connectives. What about for the modalities, box and diamond? Well, they go like this. If you've got box A being true, then you put A being true in each of the accessible boxes. OK, in each box that you've got an arrow going to. If you've got box A being false, 
Then you create a new box, join it up with an arrow and put a false in the new box. If you've got diamond A being true, then you do the same thing. You create a new box. It's got an arrow to it, but this time you put A being true. And if you've got diamond A being false, then you put A false in all the boxes that you've got an arrow going to. So box A true and diamond A false kind of work similarly. And box A false and diamond A true kind of work similarly. OK, for the first two, you do something with all the accessible boxes. And for these middle two, you create a new box and put something in it. OK, so there you have how to build a model for modal logic. Let's see how we can use that technique to build some counter models. What's a counter model? Well, suppose I give you some argument from premises to conclusion. A counter model is one that says that's a bad argument. It's not a valid entailment because our model has a possible world in it where the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So to build a counter model, what we need to do is we need the premises being true at some state, the conclusion being false at the same state. So that state makes the premises true, the conclusion false, and the model is the right type. So if we're looking for a argument that is a ref entailment, we'd better make sure our counter model is a reflexive model. So how do we build that counter model? Well, we basically do exactly what we did before. But rather than assuming that a sentence is true, what we're now going to do is assume that all of our premises are true and our conclusion is false. We put them inside a possible world and then we build up our model from there just like we did before, making sure it's the right kind of model. OK, if we're looking at a ref entailment, we want to make sure it's a reflexive counter model and so on. OK, let's look at an example. Let's try to show that box P doesn't reflexively entail box box P. So before I show you my answer, why don't you guys have a go using the technique we've just discussed? Hit pause on the video, give it a few minutes, and when you come back, see if your answer agrees with mine. OK, so here's how I worked through this one. We want to show that this doesn't entail this in reflexive models. So I start off by assuming that the premise is true and the conclusion is false. I've put it inside a possible world and I've put a loop on it because I'm after a reflexive model. The premise is telling me that I want to put P in every accessible world. This world is accessible to itself, so I'm going to put P here. This one, the rule for this tells me to build a new possible world, an accessible world, and put this being false in it. So that's what I've done there. And don't forget to put the loop on it, because remember, all of these worlds have to be accessible. Don't forget that we still have this sentence here active. It's telling us do something in all accessible worlds. Since I've just created a new accessible world, I'd better put P being true in that one as well. This one here tells me to create a new accessible world. So I do that here and we've got P being false in that one. And that's me done because I've got a valuation for each of those worlds. Here P is true, here P is true and here P is false. Note that we don't have to go back to this sentence to do something in this world because this world isn't accessible from this one. So there's our answer. It's a model in which there's a world, the one we started with, where box P is true, but box box P isn't true. Let's just have a think about what that means in context. Everywhere accessible, I want P to be true. Yep. But I want there to be a world that is two steps away where P isn't true. Just have a think about this one a bit more. You've seen a sentence a bit like this before. If we wrote that out with an arrow in between it, it would be the for axiom. OK, if box P, then box box P. That axiom corresponds to transitive models. OK, so knowing that I kind of know in advance that that inference, that entailment is valid in transitive models. So I kind of knew in advance that the kind of model I wanted was going to be a non-transitive model. In other words, there was going to be three states. I was going to have an arrow from the first to the second, the second to the first, but not from the first to the third. Because it's not a transitive model, it's going to invalidate the four axiom. And that basically means the same thing as saying the entailment from the antecedent to the consequent won't go through. 
it doesn't go through in reflexive models, but it would go through in transitive models. Okay, guys, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all your comments. I really appreciate it. Next up, we are going to be adding quantifiers to the language for some, for all. That is when things get really exciting. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon to get updates. Thank you so much for all your support. I will see you next time. Thank you.